Okay, hello and welcome everybody. This is Ben Cherry Bogan, the head of growth at Nexel, coming to you with another Nexel Fireside Chat. If this is the first time that you have joined us for Nexel Fireside Chat, first, welcome from this digital screen. The Nexel Fireside Chats are our opportunity to chat with one of our business of law experts about what they're thinking about uh, specifically in the business of law. And I am very, very, very excited today to be talking with Maya Markovich. Maya, for those of you who don't know, is the Chief Growth Officer at Next Law Labs, and I will ask her to explain that in a little bit how uh, we got here. But Maya, welcome to the Nexo Fireside Chats. Thank you so much for having me, Ben. I'm a big fan. Thank you. Well, I am a big fan of you, as you know, and I'm not just saying that you and I are uh, bounded by many uh, interests, one of which we are going to talk about today, which is psychology and behavioral economics and driving change through choice architecture. Interesting things, right? Uh, very, very, very next level thinking sort of stuff. But to get all that and set that up, why don't you tell us a little bit about who Maya is and how did we get uh, to Maya, the chief growth officer, which is just one of many roles that I know that you play. Uh, but uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, no problem. Um, yeah, I started out with an academic background in behavioral science and organizational psychology, really focused on how groups influence each other and adapt to new patterns. Um, that initially led me to change management consulting and technology. And then I went to law school to continue developing my skills, you know, in an arena where I thought I could have a broader social impact. Practiced for several years, you know, just as legal tech was getting traction. And, um, you know, while I was deploying and maximizing tech to streamline these labor intensive processes, you know, with ever increasing data and high risk of human error, I really became intrigued by how technology could improve results for clients and let lawyers spend more time on you know, strategic and creative tasks. So I eventually made the leap over to the legal tech industry um, uh, and worked for um, various product management and product marketing roles. Um, and then Nuxlaw Labs was launched and I just immediately recognized the opportunity to bring together all these threads of my experience. Yeah, that's uh, that's the incredibly short but incredibly eloquent version of it. Um, Talk to us a little bit about uh, Next Law Labs and, the, and, and how that's in some sense maybe a culmination of a lot of what you've done before. And uh, well, just tell us a little bit about Next Law Labs and its initiative yeah. and uh, how it's tied and how it's tied to sure. Dentons, et cetera. Yeah, so it was launched in 2015. It was the first initiative of its kind. And our uh, aim of the team is really to curate, pilot, and adapt solutions and processes to address these legal business challenges. So, um, you know, no, there are no two days that are the same, but a lot of what I do is change management. Um, and I draw on that experience to kind of maximize engagement and overcome resistance and drive adoption. Yeah. Um, so that's a perfect setup to our first question. Um, let's talk a little bit about you are one of the few people that I know that uh, have technology background, investment background, uh, your, I believe, a master's from Stanford, as well as undergrad, um, in, in, and a background in psychology, behavioral change, organizational change, uh, behavioral economics. So why don't we talk, let's just get it out of the way. Why is the legal industry so damn hard to change via <laughs> Oh, um, well, in one person's opinion, uh, you know, mm. change, in general, change is daunting because humans, you know, often perceive con consciously or otherwise that it represents some kind of inherent loss or threat of some kind, you know, so at a minimum, it really requires significant alteration to someone's daily routine. Some may fear they aren't going to be able to adapt to it, and they can also really kind of represent a, an existential threat um, to identity or legitimacy or a locus of control and really have very um, emotional defensive reactions. Um, I would say, you know, the tradition rich legal industry is even more susceptible to these dynamics. Um, you know, it's built for lawyers. It's not built for clients or consumers. Um, the legal industry as it currently exists is built for lawyers to run as a business. So it's not user or client centric. Um, then there's these feelings around how, you know, a lawyer's work is always bespoke. And that is a very real hurdle 
um, that any any legal tech company that is trying to sell into a legal organization is going mm -hmm. to know um, is going to come up right in, in that discussion that you know there's no possible way to automate what I'm what I'm doing everything is totally specialized. Mm -hmm. um, then there's you know accelerating regulatory complexity. The rule of law is growing. We need you know more markets need legal analysis. Risk is growing. You know in terms of privacy and piracy, cyber threats, etc. And um, and really in the face of all that, um, the the legal industry hasn't really changed much um, for 500 years or so. And so you know the day to day reality of innovating within the legal organiz legal professions really requires selling this very old kind of guild on these benefits and mandates that we're seeing in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And then of course, there's the productivity paradox, right? <laughs> because mm -hmm. of the billable hour structure, you know, eliminating works is a paradox that you have to get over. So, um, you know, legal professionals have had this strong psychological and emotional stake and um, economic stake in maintaining the status quo you know, invested years of their lives into these structures. And as hard as it is for one person to overcome fear of change, we're really dealing with a whole industry that's going through this process simultaneously and varying levels of acceptance and motivation um, to adapt. And what's really interesting to track now is how legal professionals are adopting and adapting to these new technologies and processes um, if, if they're new to the profession, because you know, they've grown up with technology, to them it's status quo. My sense is they're already establishing a new baseline and asking mm. the right questions. And I think the resistance to legal tech may age out soon. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. For the sake of time, we don't have time, but there is such an interesting uh, generational theory that I know that is flying around the world. Uh, in some sense, which is very real, right? Uh, a certain generation being replaced by another generation who fundamentally, uh, I'm looking at myself, every every uh, action that I've ever had has been mediated by a screen from the first uh, AOL chat that I that I ever had. Um, and of course, I represent a certain generation called millennials, but we, we won't get into this. Let's pick up on a specific thread, which is a lot around mindset change. Um, I have heard you speak before about the uh, uh, importance of entrepreneurial mindsets relative to maybe the other mindsets that are that are online, specifically within um, within legal. I'm looking. I'm, I'm looking at. Uh, uh, I'm looking at uh, precedent-based. I'm looking at uh, bespokeness. Um, I'm looking at um, well, you'll you'll unpack this for us. <laughs> what is the entrepreneurial mindset, and specifically, why is it? Why do you see it as a, a as a big lever uh, for driving change? You know, so you know, the classic understanding of an entrepreneur is someone who sees a problem, um, no matter how big or how small, and believes that they have a better solution and a project, an initiative, a startup is born, right? So, mm -hmm. so ca just a caveat, I think that having an entrepreneurial mindset is actually quite different from being an entrepreneur. Mm. And so the entrepreneurial mindset is really, if you think about it, this perseverance plus impact or big picture mm. thinking. Um, yeah. The reality is, is that, you know, most ideas, most startups fail, um, but it's those entrepreneurs who continue to see the world in a different way believe there's this better solution and who are brave enough to go back. It's those people who have this mindset. So it's, you know, it, you can kind of break it down into a few different things. There's for learning, impact, and courage. Um, and for mm -hmm. learning, you know, a curious mindset, you're looking for solutions to problems that aren't yet solved or could be done better. Um, impact really comes down to looking for the opportunity to, for the purpose of creating and capturing value. And you know this courage or fearlessness, um, having faith in your ability to execute what uh, what what hasn't has, hasn't been tried, or you know in general um, taking big risks to accomplish things that you think are important. Um, it's dedication, really, to sum it up, to solving these hard and complex problems with creativity despite limited resources, which <laughs> fits right in with our industry. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I want to pick up on on something that you said, and I think it's important. Uh, well, just laying it out, which is we have to understand that the entrepreneurial mindset, as you've defined it, is in some ways at odds with the training of lawyers. I know that you've spoken a little bit about this. Have you thought about how does this 
how does this shift uh, sort of happen? And then maybe we can get into the next question, but let, let's deal with that discrete. How does one go from, from, from where they were trained to, to an entrepreneurial mindset? That almost seems like a, a, a key to the kingdom, if I could be so bold. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, there, there's a lot that goes into it. It can happen at the individual mm -hmm. level, it can happen at the organization mm -hmm. level. There's, there's professional development aspects to it. Mm -hmm. I would just say, uh, you know, I mean, it depends, it depends which angle or, you know, which, which kind of audience mm -hmm. you're talking to. In general, um, there are a lot of people that come into the law hoping to do, do it in a different way or do it better. Um, and of course, you know, mm -hmm. ultimately a few years later inertia or, you know, defeatedness will set in. But I do think we're at an inflection mm -hmm. point where people are more willing to have these mm -hmm. conversations mm -hmm. and, and provide some some space for this kind of um, experimentation to occur. I'm optimistic anyway. <laughs> I, I am as well. Uh, I tend to trend toward crisis being a, <laughs> being a very good, uh, uh, um, a very, a very good uh, way to see where things are going. And I think I don't like to use the crisis word because I'm an optimist, but um, a moment of change, a moment of transition, let's just say might be among us. So I share, I share your enthusiasm. Okay, so let's pivot into sort of our next big bucket, which is behavioral economics. Behavioral economics sort of had a blast into the scene, I would say over the last 20 years, we're thinking uh, people like Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, of course, have uh, gained broad notoriety, Richard Thaler even winning the Nobel Prize in <laughs> economics uh, because of this new type of economics. Um, so maybe you can talk about what behavioral economics is, why did it come online, or at least in your opinion, why did it come online in the 2000s, uh, right? Although people say that Austrian economics was all about uh, behavioral economics as well. Um, and then how do you use it today within the context of your role? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, in my current role at Denton's, I really leverage my behavioral science background every day. Um, because, you know, behavioral economics is essentially the study of choice and judgment that are applied to yeah. economic principles. Um, it really it can it gives a really unique lens on decision making and the factors that drive behavior, right? So it's frequently leveraged um, in the areas of like market research, advertising, public mm -hmm. policy, you know, understanding how to more effectively influence behavior, you know, whether it's choosing a product or you know enrolling in a retirement plan is the example that was mm -hmm. um, widely mm -hmm. cited. Um, so at Next Law Labs, I mean, ev nearly everything we are trying to do. Um, and everything we're trying to accomplish requires, you know, very effective collaboration with a very broad and diverse set of stakeholders, um, all of whom have their own patterns and drivers and group and individual identities. So, you know, what makes them feel their work is valuable? What are their areas of responsibility? What resources do they have at their disposal? And, and really, you know, what do they feel is their professional identity? And so mm -hmm. those questions come in, at, you know, every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so the, my next question is going to be about uh, behavioral economics as it links up to change management. But I want to play something back back to you and get your opinion on it before we get to that question. You know, it seems like behavioral economics has come online um, specifically in the last ten to fifteen years as we've kind of gotten to a tough place in terms of making people transition into new things, you know, uh, and of course, the famous behavioral economic critique on old economics is people are not rational actors, right? Um, you, you have a deeper background in this. Um, why do you think that behavioral economics has sort of come up? Is it because of the inherent, uh, we know more about ourselves and we're really taking a harder look at ourselves and the way that we actually are or are not. And uh, we're thinking about economics within a uh, a more broad lens. I think you, you you get my question. Why is it? Why now is it something that we're deeply sort of trying to understand about uh, about people? Yeah. Well, it, I mean, for one thing, I will just say I am totally relieved that this is. Mm. Yes. Right. I first graduated from law school, and I was, you know, after having worked in change management and having had, you know, the behavioral mm -hmm. science background what, um, you know, I would be in interviews and people would ask me why I, why I stopped pursuing psychology. 
Mm -hmm. um, that was like almost, it was almost guaranteed that I would get a question, you know, oh, why didn't you go on to get your doctorate? Why did you decide mm -hmm. to go on? And then I would like, I, I just couldn't believe that people would not see the connection, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. between, um, between yes, right. Right. how is a jury thinking, you know, mm -hmm. how, mm -hmm. how, what is your client bringing to the table in terms mm. of just anything, right? I mean, it's a people-based business, right? And so yes. finally, I just sort of like, Kind of tried to laugh it off and now now i'm glad that people are, are really starting to think about it i think fundamentally the reason that it's coming in now into more more and more kind of into the industry discourse is mm -hmm. that clients are it, it's client driven right like any mm -hmm. change mm -hmm. um, i think mm -hmm. that is going to be meaningful in the legal industry and that is that we have a situation in which clients are asking for more and deeper types of collaboration with their outside counsel um, they expect very different things and law firms are in oftentimes trying to figure out and, and any legal service provider is going to that, that, that is seeing this kind of coming down the down the pike is going to be mm -hmm. real, trying to figure out ways to address that and also of course differentiate for business reasons so I really yes. think that um, and, and also getting the coming to the other th side of the table um, mm -hmm. with lawyers and clients, having them have a, a, a different type of relationship um, where it's not just billable hours and an invoice and, le and pure you know, legal advice, but, but much more ingrained and embedded in the, in, the, in the workings of, if we're talking about business law, um, mm -hmm. uh, is, is, I think, I, I really think that's where it's coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's get into the question that I sort of that I sort of laid on the table, which is uh, behavioral economics and change management. And you already sort of spoke about this a little bit, which is um, the famous getting people to invest and enroll in retirement plans by changing the choice structure. But can you talk a little bit about behavioral economics and change management as they sort yeah. of link together? Yeah. Sure. I mean, it is an interesting overlap, and I haven't seen a whole lot about this uh, lately. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there is kind of a risk of everyone just being like, oh, it's like the psychology stuff, lump it together. Mm -hmm. right? It right. is an interesting overlap. Um, it takes a lot of finesse on the people side to encourage enthusiasm for change in any environment. And this, you know, we've got this tradition bound, bound industry, it's particularly, in, you know, resistant to change. Behavioral economics. Mm -hmm helps explain why people act in ways that are often against their own interests. So, mm. you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, right now, a rational legal professional would mm -hmm. observe the dynamics and mm -hmm. increase the client pressures and they, they'd weigh the costs and benefits and then adapt their behavior to not only survive these challenges and stay employed, which is, you know, mm -hmm. the basic economic incentive, but also sees the moment as an opportunity to do more mm. fulfilling work, fewer repetitive tasks, get closer to their clients, you know, so, however, yes. people do not often make a rational decision, you know, <laughs> right, influenced right. by these conflicting social, emotional, psychological factors that override these economic incentives, right? So in the legal, you know, profession, like I said, there's this, you know, it's exacerbated by the productivity paradox and this counterintuitive incentive of lower efficiency mm -hmm. leading to higher revenue due to the billable hour framework. So, you know, legal organizations, like all businesses, Okay. are made up of groups of humans and they are better run when management draws on an understanding of behavioral psychology principles like collaboration and motivation and yeah. um, also understanding what influences behavior should be part of planning and implementation for any organizational change and we're talking you know macro macro the whole industry right, right? i mean it's happening in bits and pieces and um you know different different sort of levers are being pulled, but these large scale changes that are an absolute necessity <laughs> in, the, mm -hmm. in today's legal industry just have a better chance of succeeding if they're informed by the principles of behavioral economics and beyond that, when they are implemented, that the change is managed thoughtfully. Yeah, I wanna, I mean, that's perfectly well suited and I'll play it back to you uh, as a summary, really, Behavioral economics gives you an extra lens through which to look at uh, decision making. And uh, through that lens, you can start to organize or uh, make decisions uh, that um, will, will make change easier. So a behavioral economics lens gives you a simpler path 
uh, or smooth the path to change management. Still going to be hard. Mm -hmm. Still, still not going to run right. The kids are the kids are still still going to maybe grab the, uh, the the chocolate bar instead of the apple, regardless of where you put it in the line side to the eye side, right? Uh, but but Definitely. it can give you an <laughs> extra lever, an extra lever, right? Relatively speaking, uh, and right. an extra extra benefit. Um, to what extent do you believe? I, I want to ask you a, a just off the cuff question, really quickly. You know, to what extent do you believe that regulation? regulation and the re regulatory structure specifically for practice licensing to what extent do you on a on a weighted basis to what extent because you've spoken a little bit about the uh, productivity paradox to what extent do you believe the regulatory structure has has something to do with through which uh through through which through which most of these decisions are actually made um i just want to hear your off-the-cuff answer i'm sure you've thought about it yeah, it's a it's a great it's a great question. It's a whole other topic. I, I so know. Yeah. To do that. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think um, fundamentally, I mean, I it's, that could go in a lot of I could go in so mm -hmm. many different answering this question. But I think fundamentally, it is actually just yet another reason or symptom mm. or crack in the wall um, mm. about of this tradition and precedent, right? Yes. And, right. And, right. You know, and and it's a and you, you see that you know these with you know the be the I think everything's going to be kind of cracked wide open. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how fast it's going to happen, and I think it's mm -hmm. again it's gonna happen in different places at different times. It's obviously different states in the U.S., but also different practices. I think and mm -hmm. sectors I think will be more or less kind of um, affected by it in the near term. But I really think that um, ultimately. Um, when you look at it kind of at this, at this very, you know, 50,000 foot perspective, um, ground, there's a groundswell of shifts happening in all directions. Mm -hmm. And I think, I'm hoping that, you know, there will be kind of a, a, a crack um, that, that will allow folks to experiment a little bit more and think about things differently. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, no one is incentivized to think about things differently when things are going great and there are no threats. Right. Yes. Um, but but now because it's just sort of almost it's just in the ether, right? It's just every everything mm -hmm. is a question, mm -hmm. and I think that we that's a great opportunity, as well. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I asked it because I, I, I'd love to test this question. I actually think the regulatory structure of it is sort of like the crack that might in the best way, open up the deluge. Uh, I, I just think it's something about the inherent psychology of legal professionals who align themselves very much with regulatory and licensing. And, and exactly. there's something about that being shifted that will allow for a new uh, new alignment in terms of what who is a lawyer, so, something about that. I, I, I think that there's, there's something yeah. very interesting about that. Um, so who's, gonna, you know, who's gonna accelerate yes. out of the curve on that, mm -hmm. right? right? I mean, it's right. gonna be a certain subset of, of legal professionals and organizations. Yes, okay, so this is the last sort of big statement uh, or big question that I wanna ask you, uh, just to hear, hear you wax poetically about it in the best way, which is, you know, how can how can everything that we spoke about today? I, we talked a little a lot about legal innovation, a subset of that, which is giving you the behavioral economic lens that allows to for you to drive change in a much more fluid way. By sometimes I just say it's like treating people like they actually are, not like as you think that they are, you know, in a in a yeah. textbook in, in some ways. How can legal organizations really leverage this in in in, in some ways, and how have you maybe seen it best leveraged? You know, I, I mean, I like to end on an optimistic note. Yes, right? me too. There are things We're both that yeah. there are things. You know, I mean, high level, we need to go from this abstract strategy of client relationship building, really understanding what influences how and why clients behave like like they do, no matter who they are, um, whether it's a multinational corporation or whether it's um, you know a. a, a a family law matter or a, a mm -hmm. public defender matter or a pro se matter, right? Um, understanding these patterns and drivers, meeting them where they are. Um, and a firm, you know, if we're talking about firms, a firm can apply mm -hmm. this lens of behavioral economics to rethink recruiting and training 
to create this cultural culture of innovation and provide these frameworks, right, for testing ideas through experimentation, which is an absolute necessity because you will not know the right answer right out of the gate. You won't. Your best idea is never your first one. That's right. <laughs> uh, you know, it can also be applied to drive, you know, acquisition, retention. Mm -hmm. um, off process optimization, pricing strategies, you know, there's so much more, right? On an individual attorney level, uh -huh. you can really apply it by thinking about increasing emotional intelligence, self-awareness, self-regulation. Um, uh -huh. And even with the industry really changing in real time, uh -huh. it's fundamentally based on human relationships and uh -huh. understanding each other is a crucial concept. So leadership, you know, and structure needs to manage the way that change is viewed and implemented and provide this safe space um, for employees to ask questions, recognize the possibilities of working in different ways, and at minimum, right, creating a workplace that welcomes change and creative thinking. Um, and, and also, it, what's that gonna need? Conscious decisions on modeling and communicating the value of the change. And most environments have opportunities to nudge employees' behaviors by making these small changes Okay. Um, and then rather than really trying to change how entirely change how people think, you know, that's a central theme in behavioral economics. That being said, you know, on an individual level, lawyers who understand that legal expertise is only one facet of the services mm. that they provide, mm. and they're no longer the only game in town, particularly mm. the um, okay. thing that's happening, is um, are more likely to grasp the necessity of finding new business processes and ways to deliver value to clients in this very rapidly shifting marketplace. So there's this wealth of opportunity, and I might add also, it's very urgent, you know, mm -hmm. to meet, to collaborate and scale and productize. And, you know, once you see the state of the industry clearly from there, it really, it's a matter of acknowledging, you know, your professional current reality, the challenges, you know, prioritizing them and just choosing one, right, to get started and consider how it could be improved by adjusting business process or technology and then you know seeing the success around that and then building on it yeah yeah so Maya we could we could speak <laughs> at length about how you know that and we're gonna have to probably go because one of the benefits of having you as a BOL expert of course we're able to draw on you whenever you are available um and I would love to sort of go deeper um into maybe the you know eventually the work that you're doing now with Lexaw Labs and the investments that you're making uh, all all of this so lots of different topics but today was all about behavioral economics and how both it seems like lawyers can I love how you said it which is you know lawyers have this unique opportunity to truly start to expand uh, the services that they provide clients um, especially whenever they see themselves as more than just a service provider in some sense right and and behavioral economics can sort of uh, is a tool in this lens so like you I'm, I'm very optimistic that uh, lawyers smart people who think deeply are able to sort of will, will be able to get to some sort of next level outside of this local maxima as it were that we we've, we've sort of put ourselves uh, in in some sense so let's close up any final words anything that uh, anything else that you want to pass along to, to to everybody today about behavioral economics legal innovation anything that we didn't touch or cover no i would just i i mean i just to completely agree with your summary there and i would just say mm -hmm. that i think that there is an opportunity now um, you know, lawyers for in the last year in the pandemic were not, um, it, you know, everything happened and everyone threw the deck of cards up in the air and lawyers mm. were required to be, you know, they weren't expected to be an, uh, experts in some of the things okay. that they were immediately being required to do. Mm. I'm optimistic that, um, you know, there is a small window of opportunity here for, for even if you're, if, even if they don't want to experiment themselves, that um, that lawyers will see the value in that, and and I really think that there is there's you know we're at a, a moment of potential transformation where um, at least they will see the value in others experimenting, um, and and that's where the innovation is really going to come from. And it's such a buzzword, but at the the bottom line is you know in changing and improving the legal industry the way it, it, in some way right we we've got to yeah. improve it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Maya Markovich, 
uh, Chief Growth Officer at Nextlaw Labs. Thank you so much for being on the Nextlaw Fireside Chat. I, you know that I'm a nerd for this kind of stuff, so it's fantastic to have you on. It's just one of the benefits of being the head of growth at Nextlaw, you know, when uh, just getting able to talk to you. So thank you so much for being on here. Enjoy the beautiful California weather. That deck looks just incredible, and we'll speak to you soon again. Thank you so much, Ben. It's been a pleasure. You as well. So thank you everybody for tuning in again to another Nexo Fireside Chat. We will be back next week speaking to one of our fantastic be all experts on some discrete topic of business of law, be it marketing, legal innovation, legal technology, process optimization, uh, and all of it in between. So thanks so much and we'll talk to you soon. Goodbye everybody. <laughs>